Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. Living in the Light A Guide to Personal and Planetary Transformation By Shakti Gawain Chapter 16 Our Children Living as a channel for the universe applies to parenting as much as to every other area of our lives. While I don't have children myself, I have a number of friends who are using these principles in relating to their children. It certainly isn't easy to transform our old concepts and patterns of raising children, but the results are wonderful to see, bright light radiating from these children, satisfaction and fulfillment for their parents, and the depth of closeness and sharing between them. Our old ideas of parenting usually involve feeling totally responsible for the welfare of our children and trying to follow some behavior standard to be a good parent. As you learn to trust yourself and be yourself spontaneously, you may find yourself violating many of your old rules about what a good parent does. Nevertheless, the energy and aliveness that is coming through you, your increasing sense of satisfaction in your life, and your trust in yourself and the universe, will do far more to help your child than anything else possibly could. In a sense, you don't have to raise your children at all. The universe is the true parent to your children, you are simply the channel. The more you are able to follow your energy and do what is best for you, the more the universe will come through you to everyone around you. As you thrive, your children will, too. When babies are born, they are powerful, intuitive beings. Newly arrived in the physical world, they spend their first years learning to live in a body. Their forms are younger and less experienced than ours, but their spirits are just as developed as ours. In fact, I believe that we often have children who are spiritually more developed than we are, so that we can learn from them. Our children come into the world as clear beings. They know who they are and what they are here to do. I believe that on some level of consciousness, parents and children have made an agreement. The parents have agreed to support and assist the child in developing his form, body, mind, and emotions, and learning how to operate in the world. The child has agreed to help the parents be more in touch with their intuitive selves. Because children have not yet lost their conscious connection to their spirit, they provide us with considerable support in reconnecting with our own higher selves. Our children essentially need two things from us, one, they need to be recognized for who they really are. If we see and know that they are powerful and sophisticated spiritual beings and relate to them that way from the beginning, they will not need to hide their power and lose touch with their soul, as many of us have. Their being will receive the support and acknowledgement they need to remain clear and strong. 2. They need us to create an example for them of how to live effectively in the world of form. As we do this, they watch how we live and imitate us. Being very perceptive and pragmatic, they copy what we actually do, and not what we say. In return for taking responsibility for these two things, we receive from our children endless amounts of vibrant energy. Unless they are shut down at a very early age through lack of support, children are very clear and powerful channels. Because they have not yet developed much rational censorship, they are almost totally intuitive, completely spontaneous, and absolutely honest. From watching them, we can learn a great deal about how to follow energy and live creatively. Most parents have not been able to fulfill their responsibilities as successfully as they would have wished. In general, parents have been confused about their roles and responsibilities. They haven't had any clear models or guidelines. Until very recently in human history, no one did much research on parenting, and there are still very few resources for educating oneself about how to be a parent. Most people parent in a rather hit-or-miss fashion. So, everyone has made plenty of mistakes. I've met a lot of parents who, now that they have become more conscious, feel tremendous guilt and sadness in looking back on how they've raised their children. It's helpful to remember that children are powerful, spiritual beings who are responsible for their own lives, 
they chose you as a parent so that they could learn the things they needed to work out in this lifetime. Also, it helps tremendously to know that as you grow and evolve, they will be positively affected and supported by your transformation. They will change as you change, even if they are grown and live far away from you. All relationships are telepathic, so no matter what the physical distance, they will continue to reflect you. Because we have not been sufficiently attuned to our own being, it's been hard to recognize and trust the spirit within our children. Because they were physically undeveloped and rationally unsophisticated, we thought they were less aware and less responsible than they really are. I've observed in many people the underlying attitude that children are somewhat helpless or untrustworthy and that parents are responsible for controlling and molding them into responsible beings. Children, of course, pick up this attitude and reflect it in their behavior. If you recognize and treat them as powerful, spiritually mature, responsible beings, they will respond accordingly. Children as mirrors. Because young children are relatively unspoiled, they are our clearest mirrors. As intuitive beings, they are tuned in on a feeling level and respond honestly to the energy as they feel it. They haven't learned to cover up yet. When adults do not speak or behave according to what they are actually feeling, children pick up the discrepancy immediately and react to it. Watching their reactions can help us become more aware of our own suppressed feelings. For example, if you are trying to appear calm and collected when inside you are feeling upset and angry, your children may mirror this to you by becoming wild and disruptive. You are trying to maintain control, but they pick up the chaotic energy inside of you and reflect it in their behavior. Oddly enough, if you express directly what you are truly feeling without trying to cover it up, I'm feeling really upset and frustrated because I've had a rotten day. I'm mad at the world and at myself and at you. I want you to be quiet so I can have peace and quiet to try to sort out my feelings. Will you please go outside for a few minutes, they will usually calm down. They feel comfortable with the truth and the congruity between your feelings and your words. Many parents think they have to protect their children from their, the parents, confusion or so-called negative feelings. They think that being a good parent means maintaining a certain role, always being patient, loving, wise, and strong. In fact, children need honesty, they need to see a model of a human being going through all the different feelings and moods that a human being goes through and being honest about it. This gives them permission and support to love themselves and allow themselves to be real and truthful. Sharing your feelings with your children does not mean dumping your anger on them or blaming them for your troubles. It also does not mean you can expect them to be your partner or therapist and help you with your problems. The more you practice expressing your feelings honestly as you go along, the less likely you are to do these things. Being human, however, you probably will dump your anger or frustration on them from time to time. Once you see that you've done it, Tell them you realize that you dumped on them and that you are truly sorry, and then let it go. It's all part of learning to be in close relationships. Children also serve as our mirrors by imitating us from a very young age. We are their model for behavior, so they pattern themselves after us. Thus, we can watch them to see what we are doing. Children often reflect either our primary selves, in the ways they are similar to us, or our own disowned selves, in the ways they are different from us. When they behave in ways that we find upsetting or mystifying, they are usually acting out one or more of our disowned selves, our shadow side. For example, a woman friend of mine is a very sweet, loving person who is a committed pacifist. She was shocked and horrified to discover that her little boy loved playing with toy guns, of course, he was reflecting her disowned aggressive side. When your child does something you don't like, tell him or her how you feel about it and deal with it directly, but, also ask yourself in what way that behavior mirrors you or how you might be supporting it in your own process. For example, if your children are being secretive and hiding things from you, ask yourself if you have been really open and honest about all your feelings with them. Is there something you are hiding from someone or from yourself? 
Is there some way you don't trust yourself and therefore don't trust them? If your children are being rebellious, take a look at the relationship between your own inner authoritarian and rebel. If your inner authoritarian has a lot of control in your life, your children may be acting out your suppressed rebellious side. Or, if you've acted out the rebel a lot in your life, they may be imitating you. Take a good look at how these problems reflect your inner process. If you learn from your experiences and grow, so will your children. Externally, a lot of these problems can be worked through by deeply and sincerely sharing your feelings and learning to assert yourself, and by encouraging your children to do the same. You may want to get support from a professional counselor or family therapist to help the whole family change its old patterns. I have found that, for many people, parenting has been a convenient excuse not to do their own learning and growing. Frequently, parents spend most of their time focusing on their children, trying to make sure that the children learn and grow properly. In taking responsibility for their children's lives, they abandon responsibility for their own lives. This has the unfortunate result of making the children feel, unconsciously, that they have to take responsibility for their parents, because their parents are sacrificing for them. Children may imitate their parents' behavior by taking responsibility for other people, or they may rebel against the pressure to con, form to their parents' expectations by acting out the opposite of what their parents want. Parents need to shift the focus of their responsibility from their children back to themselves, where it belongs. Remember that children learn by example. They will tend to do what you do, not what you tell them to do. The more you learn to take care of yourself and live a fulfilling, happy life, the more they will do the same. This doesn't mean you should abandon or ignore your children. It doesn't mean that you let them do whatever they want. You are in a deep relationship with them and like any other relationship, it takes a lot of caring and communication. It's important for all of you to express feelings, make needs known, and set clear boundaries. Furthermore, you have accepted certain responsibilities to care for them physically and financially. You have a right to require their co-responsibility and cooperation in that process. The key is in your attitude. If you truly see your children as powerful, responsible entities and treat them as equal to you in spirit, while acknowledging that they are less experienced than you in form, they will mirror that attitude back to you. From the time they are born, assume that they know who they are and what they want, and that they have valid feelings and opinions about everything. Even before they can talk, ask them for their feelings about things they are involved in and trust your intuition and the signals they give you to know what their answers are. For example, ask them if they'd like to be included in an outing or if they'd rather stay home with a babysitter. Trust your feelings about which choice they are making and proceed accordingly. Then pay attention to the signals they give. If you take them on an outing and they cry the whole time, next time try leaving them with the babysitter. As they grow older, continue to include them in family decisions and responsibilities. As much as possible, allow them to make their own decisions about their personal lives. This means they may sometimes have to deal with the consequences of making certain decisions. Offer them your love, support, and advice, but let it be understood that their lives are basically their own responsibility. Be sure you set your own boundaries clearly, what is okay and what isn't. Making their own decisions does not include the right to take advantage of you. Above all, try to communicate your honest feelings to them and ask them to let you know how they are feeling. Almost all family problems arise from lack of communication. Your children certainly aren't going to know how to communicate clearly if you don't know how. It seems to be terribly difficult for parents to give up living their children's lives for them and start living their own. In order to do this, Parents have to be willing to admit how dependent they really are on their children and how frightened they feel about letting go of them. These feelings are usually masked by a reverse projection, parents will tell themselves that their children are dependent on them and won't be okay if their parents start focusing on fulfilling their own needs. I have found that this is a false issue. The real issue is the parents' feelings of dependency on their children, which they usually aren't even conscious of. 
Children are so alive and exciting, parents often secretly fear that their lives will be drab and dull without their children. Or, perhaps they are just afraid to face themselves. Once they recognize and acknowledge these feelings, they will begin to deal with the emptiness within themselves and their lives. They will begin to look at what they want and how they can satisfy themselves. They will begin to trust their own gut feelings about things and act on them. At this point, the children really start to flourish. They are finally liberated from the unconscious task of trying to take care of their parents, they are freed to make their own lives worthwhile. The children start doing what they really need to do for themselves. They can now become the channels they truly are. One couple who are close friends of mine have a beautiful daughter. Since before she was born, her parents were aware of her as a powerful being and felt that they were in communication with that being. I was present at her home birth, a wonderful event. A few minutes after she was born, I was holding her and she looked strongly and directly into my eyes, I had previously heard that babies can't focus at such an early age. It was quite apparent to me that she was well aware of what was happening. She has been raised much as I have described. She has always been afforded the respect that she deserved and was treated as a highly conscious entity. As a result, she is a truly remarkable child. Wherever she goes, people remark on her strong presence. It's easy to see that she is an open channel for the universe. Meditation. Get comfortable, relax, and close your eyes. Take a few deep breaths and move your awareness into a deep, quiet place within you. Picture or imagine your child in front of you. Look into his or her eyes and sense the powerful being within. Take a little time just to be with this experience and receive any feelings, ideas, or impressions about who your child really is. Communicate to him or her, in your own words, your respect and appreciation. Imagine that your child is communicating to you his or her respect and appreciation. If you have more than one child, do this with each one of them. This meditation is effective in opening the love and communication between you and your children, whether they are infants or adults. Exercise Practice telling the truth to your children and expressing your feelings honestly with them even if you feel vulnerable and uncomfortable about not being in control. Ask them how they feel about things and try to really listen to what they have to say. If you are tempted to give advice, ask them if they want to hear it first. If they don't, tell them your feelings instead. Chapter 17 Work and Play Our culture is obsessed with achievement and productivity. As a result we have an epidemic of workaholism in which most of us push ourselves much harder than is necessary or healthy. We need to learn to relax, nurture ourselves, and have fun. Some people carry the opposite polarity, they know how to relax and play, but have difficulty focusing and working hard enough to accomplish things. When you're following your energy and doing what feels right to you, moment by moment, the distinction between work and play tends to dissolve. Work is no longer what you have to do and play what you want to do. When you are doing what you love, you may work harder and produce more than ever before, but you will experience such enjoyment and pleasure in your work that at times it may feel like play. Each one of us has a true purpose and each one of us is a unique channel for the universe. We make a contribution to the world just by being ourselves every moment. There need not be rigid categories in our lives, this is work, this is play. It all blends into the flow of following the universe, and money flows in as a result of the open channel that's created. Work is no longer something you have to do in order to survive and sustain life. You no longer work just for the sake of making money. Instead, the delight that comes from expressing yourself becomes the greatest reward. The money comes along as a natural part of being alive. For some, working and getting money may no longer even be directly related to each other, you may experience that you are doing whatever you have the energy to do and that money is coming into your life. It's no longer a matter of, you do this and then you get money for it. 
The two things are simply operating simultaneously in your life but not necessarily in a direct cause and effect relationship. In the new world, it's difficult to pin life's work and true purpose down to any one thing. In terms of looking for a career, our old world concept told us that when we became adults, we had to decide what our career would be and then pursue an education or other steps to achieve that career. The career would then be pursued for most, or all, of our life. In the new world, many of us are channels for a number of things that may come together in fascinating combinations. Perhaps you haven't found your career because it doesn't exist yet. Your particular and unique way of expressing yourself has never existed before and will never be repeated again. As you practice following the energy in your life, it may lead you in many directions. You may express yourself in a variety of areas, all of which will begin to synthesize in some surprising, interesting, and very new, creative way. You will no longer be able to say, I'm a writer, or a fireman or a teacher or a housewife. You may be a combination of all of those things. You'll be doing what you love, what you're good at, what comes easily to you and has an element of challenge and excitement to it. Whatever you do will feel satisfying and fulfilling to you. It will no longer be a matter of doing things now for later gratification, I will work hard now so that I can get a better job later. I will work hard now so that I can retire and enjoy my life. I will work hard now in order to have enough money and time to have a vacation where I can have fun. It's the fulfillment of what you're doing at this very moment that counts. In being a channel, everything you do becomes a contribution, even the simplest things are significant. It is the energy of the universe moving through us that transforms, not just the specific things we do. When I write a book that has a certain impact on a reader's life, it's because of the energy of the universe that comes through me and connects to the reader's deeper levels of awareness. The words and ideas are the icing on the cake. They are the things that enable our minds to grasp what has already been changed. It is not so important that I wrote a book. What is important is that I expressed myself, opened up, and allowed the creative energy to flow through me. That creative energy is now penetrating other people and things in this world. I had the joy of that energy moving through me and other people had the joy of receiving that energy. That's the transformational experience. Whether you are washing the dishes, taking a walk, or building a house, if you're doing it with a sense of being right where you want to be and doing what you want to be doing, that fullness and joy in the experience will be felt by everyone around you. If you're building a house and somebody walks by and sees you doing it, they will feel the impact of the fullness of your experience. Their lives will be transformed to the degree that they are ready to allow the energy's impact. Though they may not know what hit them, they will start to experience life differently. It's the same when you're just being. If you walk into a room, feeling whole, and expressing yourself in whatever way feels right to you, then every one in the room will be affected and catalyzed in their own growth process. Even though they may not recognize it or know anything about it consciously, you may at times be able to see the direct result of your channel operating. You will see proof of it in watching the changes in people. It is an incredibly exciting and satisfying experience. You can see that it may no longer be an issue of focusing on one lifelong career. At times in your life, you may be led to focus and build structure in one particular area of knowledge or expertise. You may choose to learn certain skills that you will use to allow your channel to function in a way that it wants to function. If you do this, you will be led through the learning experience easily and naturally. The process of learning will be just as satisfying as the doing. In other words, it is no longer necessary to sacrifice in the moment so that in the future you will be able to have what you want. The learning process can be fun, joyful, and exciting. You'll experience it as being exactly what you want to be doing at that time. Practicing, learning skills, going to school, all of this can be fun and fulfilling when you are following your intuitive guidance. The work you do as a result will also be a learning experience. 
For example, I teach workshops, not because I've mastered the information and I am the expert, but because I love to share myself in this way. This sharing deepens my learning experience. Again, there is no strong boundary between learning and teaching, just as there is no wall between work and play. It all begins to blend and weave into one integrated and balanced experience. Most people do have some sense, at least deep inside, of what they would love to be doing. This feeling is often so repressed, however, that it is experienced only in the form of some wildly impractical fantasy, something you could never do. I always encourage people to get in touch with these fantasies. Observe and explore thoroughly your most incredible fantasy of how you'd like to be and what you'd like to be doing. There is truth in this desire. Even if it seems impossible, there is at least a grain of truth in the image. It is telling you something about some part of you that's wanting to be expressed. Your fantasies can tell you a great deal about yourself. Many times, I've found that people have a strong sense of what they would like to do, yet they take up a career that is very different from their desire. Sometimes they go for the opposite because they feel it is practical or will gain the approval of their parents or the world. They figure it is impossible to do what they really want, so they might as well settle for something else that comes along. I encourage people to risk exploring the things that really turn them on. The following are examples of people I've worked with and their exploration of their true purpose. 1. A brilliant and talented woman I know had been working with sick and dying people for many years. Although she was a great nurse and a powerful healer, it became evident to her that she needed to be where she could express herself more creatively. With encouragement, she started working fewer days as a nurse and began leading workshops and counseling people. Because she's doing this, she feels more fulfilled and those around her feel her fulfillment, as well. 2. Joseph was a young man in his early twenties. Following family tradition, he went into business with his father and brothers. He was very successful in real estate and contracting. The problem was, he knew there was something else he wanted to do with his life. After lots of encouragement from the group in one of my work shops, he admitted that he wanted to work in the arts, but knew his family would frown on it. He most wanted to be a dancer. The first step was admitting to himself what he wanted to do. Eventually, he mustered the courage to take dance classes. He had a lot of talent and immediately attracted the attention of the teacher. He continued to explore this form of artistic expression. When he supported his desires, he actually found that his family was equally supportive. 3. A close friend of mine had three children, no college education, and was living on welfare. Her desire was to get into business. She intuitively felt she was going to handle large amounts of money, but considering her situation, this didn't make sense. Nevertheless, she decided to explore some possibilities in the financial district of San Francisco. She was immediately hired as a receptionist, she went on to be an administrative assistant and continued to rise to higher levels of skill and responsibility. She eventually reached her goal of being a stockbroker. She loves what she's doing and her children are flourishing as well. Four, a woman who came to a recent workshop of mine shared that she'd been a talented pianist with hopes of becoming a con, cert pianist. Then, for several reasons, the most predominant being a lack of faith in herself, she had given up her dream. She started working in an office and found that between work and her children, she had little time for her music. After 15 years, she felt it was simply too late to ever go back to the piano. She felt the time she had lost in not playing rendered hopeless any chance of being great. Despite all her doubts, we encouraged her to at least start playing again. I assured her that if she was doing what she loved, it would come back to her easily. As she opened to this idea, she started opening to herself. Her sense of hopelessness was replaced by a renewed sense of power. She called later to say she had been playing the piano and feeling great about it. A friend had asked her to play accompaniment for a choral group and she was feeling very excited about the musical possibilities starting to happen for her. Meditation 
sit or lie down in a comfortable position. Close your eyes and relax. Take several slow, deep breaths, relaxing your body more deeply with each breath. Take several more breaths and relax your mind. Release and relax all the tension in your body. If you want, imagine that your body is almost sinking into the floor, bed, or chair. From this very relaxed place inside, imagine that you are doing exactly what you want in your life. You have a fabulous career that is fun and fulfilling for you. You are now doing what you've always fantasized about and getting well paid for it. You feel relaxed, energized, creative, and powerful. You are successful at what you do because it is exactly what you want to be doing. You follow your intuition moment to moment and are richly rewarded for it. Exercises 1. Follow any impulses you have in the direction of your true work slash play slash creative desires. Even if it seems totally unrealistic, follow the impulse anyway. For example, if you're 65 years old and have always wanted to be a ballet dancer, go to a ballet class and observe, or, if you want, take a beginning class. Watch some ballet and imagine that you're a dancer. While alone at home, put on some music and dance. This will get you in touch with the part of yourself that wants to be expressed that way. You may end up dancing much more than you thought possible, and you may be led to other forms of expression that will feel as good. 2. List any fantasies you've had around work, career, or creativity, and beside that, list the action you plan to take to explore this. 3. Write an ideal scene, a description of your perfect job or career exactly as you would like it to be. Write it in the present tense, as if it were already true. Put in enough description and details to make it seem very real. Put it away somewhere and look at it again in a few months or even a year or two. Unless your fantasy has changed completely in that time, chances are that you will find you have made significant progress in the direction of your dream.